Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, evaluate division. I don't know if I'm getting dumber or these leak code problem descriptions are getting a lot worse. Well, I guess this is one of the early problems, but I'm just gonna skip straight to the example because it's a lot easier to understand it that way. We're given a list of equations where the equations could be given like this. And keep in mind that these are strings. So A and B are going to be strings. And what one of these subarrays represents is A divided by b. So that's what this equation is. This equation is similar, b divided by c. So every equation is going to be in this form with some numerator and some denominator. We're also given a second array of the same size, which actually tells us the result of each of these equations. So in this case, a divided by b, we can see down here, it's kind of hard to tell, but the value is going to be 2. So a divided by b is going to be 2. b divided by c is going to be 3. Cool. Now we are also given a list of queries. So that's what green is going to represent. And those queries are going to be in a similar shape as the equation. So it's going to be a sub list. In this case, one of the queries is going to be a C. So what we want is to know the result of a divided by C. Now it's not necessarily going to be true that we'll be able to determine it. And if we can't determine it, we have to put a negative one as the result. But if we can determine it, then we have to put the value of this equation like what it evaluates to. And then we have to build a output array. So for each one of these queries, we'd have some output value. Now, in this case, A divided by C, can we determine it? Well, let's not even think about code for a second. Let's just try to look at like the math Hopefully your algebra skills are good enough to be able to evaluate this. A divided by B is equal to two and B divided by C is equal to three. Well, take a look, we can kind of multiply these two together and the B over here is gonna cancel out the B over here. And then we're gonna end up with A divided by C and multiplying two and three together, like that's the value of these two equations. So two times three is gonna be six. So we were able to determine it this time. I have no idea how we would code that up yet, but we were able to get the result of this query, which is six. And that's what they have in the output as well. Now, a quick edge case worth mentioning is what if some of these equations or the queries, like something like this, a divided by E. Well, we weren't even given an E character in the input, so it's definitely not possible to evaluate this. So for sure, we would put a negative one in the output, and that's what they do for this one. It's over here. Another edge case, and this one I think is kind of dumb. I really don't understand this. Take a look at this over here, X, X. So we don't know what X is. That's perfectly fine, but X divided by X should probably be one, right? Unless we have some kind of divide by zero, which I believe they mention will never really be the case and we won't have any contradiction. So we don't have to worry about that, thankfully. You would think this would evaluate to positive one, but I guess in this case it doesn't. Over here, X divided by X gets us a negative one. You can't really see it anymore, but it does give you a negative one, or at least that's the expected result. That's kind of stupid in my opinion, but okay, we just have to account for that. The first thing I personally tried was maybe we can just solve for every single variable and then it'll be pretty easy to know the result of every query because they literally are just A divided by you know, some other variable. That's the form of every single query. My math skills are sharp enough to recognize that we actually can't do that in this case. We have in this case, two equations, but we have three variables, A, B, C. So we simply do not have enough equations, unique equations, to be able to determine the value of A and B. It's ambiguous. And if you don't believe me, let me prove it to you. Let's just say hypothetically the value of A is two. Then what must be the value of B to get an output of two? Probably one. Okay, let's say A is two, B is one. Okay, then we get a one over here. Then what's gonna be the value of C? Probably a fraction in this case, one third. One divided by one third is gonna give us three in the output. This is one way of solving this equation. You can tell this math definitely works out. But now let me change it up. Let me transform A over here to now be a four and transform this to be a two. And so that means it's a two over here as well. And then that means for this to equal three, we have to make this two 
thirds. This is another way that the equations do work out. So what you find is we can't actually determine the value of each variable. And clearly this is a very simple example, but we could have had a ton more equations. And at this point, if I gave you this problem in an interview, I would definitely expect you to need a hint because it's not very intuitive how to solve this problem. But actually it turns out we can transform these equations in a graph representation, which will allow us to solve this problem. Notice how when we have a query like a divided by c, we start with whatever we can. We start with maybe a divided by b. And at this point, we need a way to cancel this b. So we would look for all the other spots in our list of equations where b is in the numerator spot because then we can get a fraction in this form something in the denominator who cares it's an x but we can get something in this form where we cancel out like this and we have a divided by x we don't necessarily know we'll ever be able to figure out what a divided by c is but this is our best bet we have to sort of cancel out the denominator because if we multiply this by something else like if i multiply this by d divided by e we're not getting any closer to this, are we? That's a little bit of the intuition. And also notice that when we do this, b divided by c, we are multiplying the values together. So this is a little bit of the intuition of why we want to map every single numerator to all of the possible denominators that it has in any of these list of equations. And it could have multiple, of course. In this case, our graph kind of looks like this shape. A points to B, B points to C. Now, it could have been possible that A you know, points to something else, like an X. In this case, though, our graph is pretty simple, so let's just try to understand this itself. Can I ask you if we start at A and traverse the graph and end up getting to B, what does that represent? Doesn't that kind of look similar to this, like actually multiplying the equations together? This is kind of like A divided by B. This is B divided by C. And what we were doing with these values is trying to multiply them, so wouldn't it be kind of good to put the edges as the value of each equation. So a divided by b is equal to 2, b divided by c is equal to 3. Then the way we formulated the problem, a path from a to c multiplying all of the edges together must mean that a divided by c is equal to the multiplication of the edges. It's equal to 6 because of the way that we formulated it. I know this is kind of a crazy idea that really isn't common in data structures and algorithms. You probably haven't seen it before, so it might take you a second to really understand it, but it's pretty simple what's actually going on here. Now, another question you might have is, what if we're going in reverse order? C going to B going to A. Like that's a perfectly valid query. What if they instead ask C divided by A? Well, the way I formulated this was a little bit naive. Now we kind of realize numerators point to denominators, sure, but shouldn't denominators also point to the numerators as well? Can't we kind of do this in reverse order? Can't I also say this equation C divided by B which is, you know, the reverse of this, reverse of this, multiplied by B divided by A, which is the reverse of this, isn't that perfectly valid as well? That gives us C divided by A. Yeah, I don't see any reason we can't do that, but if we try to multiply the edges going in reverse order, we still end up with six. So how can it be possible that A divided by C equals six and C divided by A equals six? I'm pretty sure that's a contradiction, and it is, and that's when you realize when we go in the reverse direction, we should take the inverse of these values because that's exactly what these are. These are the inverses of each other. If you don't remember what an inverse is, it's basically one divided by this number. So what we essentially learned here is that our graph is going to be directed. The edge going in this direction is not going to have the same weight as the edge going in the other direction. This one will have a weight of one divided by three, and this one will have a weight of one divided by two. So this is basically how you need to formulate the problem in order to solve it. 
Is it intuitive? Not for me, but I hope it's starting to make sense for you. And I'm a big math fan, so I thought this was one of my favorite problems I ever solved. Okay, so knowing all of that, how are we actually gonna solve the problem? Well, first we're of course gonna have to build this graph, essentially just building an adjacency list using these as our edges, and we are given the values as well. Those are gonna be the weights of each edge, and we're gonna build like the reverse edges as well. And then for every single query, we are kind of gonna do it a brute force approach, which thankfully is good enough for this problem because it is a medium. So I think that should be perfectly fine. And by brute force, I mean on the graph for every single query, we're either going to run a depth first search or a breadth first search. So potentially traversing the entire graph. I believe the time complexity is going to be N for the number of queries multiplied by the size of the graph, which I believe is E plus V where edges plus vertices. To simplify this, I think just having E for like the length of the equations is probably sufficient. N times E where this is the number of queries. Space complexity should just be the size of the graph, which is going to be V plus E. So now let's go ahead and code this up. Like I said, first step is going to be building the graph. In Python, what I'm going to do is create a hash map collections.default dict where the default value is going to be a list because what we know is we're going to map every numerator or just every number A such that it's mapped to a list of pairs where each pair is going to be B, where B is just a variable. And the second value is going to be the evaluation of A divided by B. If this doesn't make sense, don't worry. It'll probably make sense as I actually build this. So what we're going to do is iterate through every equation. But in Python, we can do it like this for I equation in enumerate the list of equations. Reason I'm using enumerate is we not only get the value from equations, which is here, but we also get the index as well, which just saves us a little bit of boilerplate. And then we can unpack the variables from the equation because we do know it's a pair of variables. We know we want to build directly directed edges. So from A, we're going to append the neighbor B. And what is the evaluation of A divided by B? Well, thankfully, that's going to be stored in values at index I. You can see why we needed the index I now. And we also know we want to do the same thing going in the opposite direction. So we might just say B divided by A, but there's a bug. Remember, it's not going to have the exact same weight. So we want to take the inverse of this. So we say one divided by that. In Python, one slash means decimal division, which is exactly what we want in this case. If you're using like Java, I think that'll be integer division. So you want to keep that in mind. But next, we just want to run every query and get the result of it. We can do that with a DFS or a BFS. I'm going to do BFS. The main reason is it's easier to handle cycle detection, and it's possible that our graph could have a cycle. So BFS just makes it a little bit easier for us. What I'm going to be passing into our BFS is going to be the source and the target. And what that's going to be in this case is if we were given a query like A divided by B, then the source is A and we want to find a path starting from A getting to B. And once we get to B, we just want to multiply the weight of all those edges and return that. So that's what this is going to be doing. So before I even implement it, I like to show you how I'm actually going to be using this. So for every query in our list of queries, we want to call BFS passing in Q at index zero as the source and Q at index one as the target. And we can use this to build an array, but in Python, we have a nicer syntax called list comprehension. So we can build a list just like this by putting a for loop inside of it. So for every query, this is the value that we want to add to the list and it will execute in order as well. So this is the result that we're going to end up returning. And now all we have to do is actually implement the BFS. And before I forget, I want to say that remember if any of the source or the destination is not in our list of equations, which means it's not in the adjacency list, then we want to return negative one immediately, even if we're given something where the source and the target are equal. Like I said, I think that's kind of weird. X divided by X should always be one, but in this case, they want it to be negative one, I guess. So if source is not in the adjacency list or target, is not in the adjacency list, we return negative one. Now we have our pretty cookie cutter breadth first search where we're gonna need a Q and a hash set. And I'm gonna use a deck and a hash set like this. 
we initialize our queue just starting at the source, but I'm actually gonna also add a second value because remember, we do want to keep track of the multiplication of all the edges. But since we're not doing this in like a depth first search way where we might go to A to B to C, etc. We're doing it layer by layer. We could start at A and then the next layer could be something like A and D. And then the next layer could be something like C and E. So we want to simultaneously keep track of the multiplication of these edges and these edges. So instead of having a bunch of variables to do that, we can just use the queue itself. Every time we add a value from our graph to the queue, we're not just gonna add the value, we're gonna add the total multiplication of the edges so far. What do you think would be a good starting value for our source node to have for the like multiplication? Probably just one, because it's a neutral value. Any value multiplied by one will end up being that value. And I also like to immediately add to the hash set the source node. And then we want to do a BFS. So while the queue is not empty, we want to pop from the queue. We're gonna append to the right. So we wanna pop from the left. And when we pop, we end up getting the node and the weight. I'm gonna store that in N for node, W for the weight. And you might think, let's immediately just start going through the neighbors in the adjacency list of the node n. But remember, before we do that, we're looking for the target. If we find the target, there's no point in continuing. We're not doing this for fun. We're looking for the target. So if we get to a point where n is equal to the target, then we can go ahead and return. What should we return? Weren't we trying to multiply all of the weights? Well, yeah, but remember, when we append to the queue, we're gonna be appending the multiplication up until this node. So W is already the value we wanna return. So just go ahead and return it here. Okay, we have that handled, and we know actually this might not always execute. So to be safe, let's put a negative one over here. It's possible that both the nodes exist in the graph, but there just happens to not be a path connecting them. In that case, we would return negative one. But now as we go through every neighbor of this node, we remember that we're not just going through the neighbor, we're going through the pair which is the neighbor and the weight. So the second parameter is gonna be weight. Well, not parameter, it's a variable. And I know this can be slightly confusing because we have two variables referring to the weight. But now for this neighbor, we want to traverse the BFS from this node as well, but only if it's not been visited. So we say for neighbor not in visit, if neighbor is not in visit, then we can go ahead and append to the queue this neighbor and the new weight. How do we get the weight? Do we just add the weight of this node? That's not enough because that's only the weight connecting A and B. Do we just add the W value? Nope, that's only the multiplication of the nodes before we reached this node. We actually want to multiply them together, W times weight. And we also, before we forget, want to make sure this node is marked visited. So I believe that is the entire code. Let me go ahead and run this to make sure that it works. Okay, it's always the simplest things you mess up on. I think I forgot to add dict over here. This is a default dict. And also when I append to a list, we're appending a pair, but here I didn't really do that. So I wanna wrap this in a list and this one as well. Okay, now let's run this to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes it does and it's pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.